Now, influenza virus entry is, is the best studied, and this is a cartoon of that. Uh, and remember, these viruses bind sialic acid. The HA of the virus binds sialic acid. They get taken up into the cell by endocytosis. So now this is an example of an endocytic route of uptake. Virus gets taken into the cell. Here at each step uh, is a cartoon of the hemagglutinin bound to sialic acid. So here is the viral membrane, the cell membrane. These are the heads of the hemagglutinin binding sialic acid, which isn't shown here. And I want to point out here the red sequences down near the viral membrane. Those are the fusion peptides. Again, they're hidden. In general, you have to hide these fusion peptides because they will fuse with the wrong cell if they're exposed. So as these endosomes move into the cell, as you know, they become acidified. Pro there are pumps in the endosome membrane that actively transport protons into the interior, becomes acidified, and at about a pH of 5 to 6, that causes a conformational change in the hemagglutinin. So these fusion peptides flip up and they insert into the cell membrane. You can see going from down by the viral membrane into the cell. The heads of the HA fall away. <clears throat> and then uh, this entire HA begins to hairpin. It bends. It draws the two molecules together. And eventually, the virus membrane and the endosome membrane fuses and the viral ribonucleoprotein can exit the capsid or exit the virus particle. So it's an acid catalyzed, it's a low pH catalyzed fusion between the virus and the cell membrane and it's carried out by the HA molecule. So low pH does all of this. It's really remarkable. These, uh, these steps in this process are known because we have a crystal structure of, of the different intermediates in the HA. So here on the left uh, is um, the HA molecule in its native state at, at neutral pH. Here's the globular head and the fibrous stem. This is a trimer. The active molecule is a trimer. And I forgot to point out to you, this is three separate individual molecules here. That's why you see three heads. In order for this molecule to undergo these dramatic conformational changes at low pH, it has to be cleaved has to be cleaved right down here in this yellow loop where it says cleavage site. And that is because the fusion peptide is located in this loop. So there's another control to make sure that fusion doesn't occur randomly. They have the fusion peptide buried in a sequence which has to be exposed by cleavage. So here's the uncleaved form, here's the cleaved form that now gives you an N-terminus which contains that fusion peptide. And finally, this is the low pH form of the HA. This fusion peptide has now been extended to the top of this alpha helix right here. So normally uh, this alpha helix is shorter. Uh, at low pH, the fusion peptide extends the length of the alpha helix and the fusion peptide is right up here. So it can be inserted into the membrane. So once again, the cleavage is needed to expose that fusion peptide and the low pH then brings it to the top of the molecule so that it can insert uh, into the cell membrane. And I, I talked before about this hairpinning uh, idea, and this is a cartoon of that. So here's a hemagglutinin trimer, it's simplified. Uh, it's, it's, um, here it's just shown in a pre-fusion state. Uh, at low pH, the fusion peptides extend to insert into the cell membrane. So virus is down here, cell is at the top. Uh, and these, of course, are, are multimers. And then you see the hairpinning occurring. So the whole hemagglutinin is bending. And we know this happens. We've seen this happen structurally. And when it bends, it brings the two membranes together. So they're very close. They exclude water molecules, and then they can fuse. And then you get a pore form that expands, and then the, R the viral RNA comes out. So low pH-mediated fusion requires exp exposure of the fusion peptide by the low pH. It requires a cleavage of the protein to expose the and terminal fusion peptide. And hairpinning is what brings uh, the, the membranes close together. Now this, this protein, this hemagglutin of influenza virus, is very much like uh, the glycoproteins of a few other viruses, uh, SV5, a paramyxovirus, Ebola virus, HIV1, a retrovirus of mice. These all have these very similar trimeric 
fusion proteins, which are all shown here in their extended low pH conformation. So they all exist on the surface, folded up, burying the fusion peptide, and they all rearrange at low pH. And these are called class one fusion proteins. They're typically perpendicular to the membrane, mostly alpha helical, as you can see, and they all form trimers. There are a couple of other kinds of fusion proteins. Uh, they're, they're class two, which are very different. You can see them here. Uh, these are mostly beta sheets. You see there's very little alpha helices in these uh, type two fusion proteins. They form dimers typically instead of trimers. And they're parallel to the membrane. So in contrast to the influenza HA and the other type one fusion proteins, the type two are parallel to the membrane. Now they, this is how they would look like on the virus particle, these type two uh, fusion proteins. Here is dengue virus. Uh, with the type 2 fusion proteins laying on its surface. So this actually does work even though you think that by lying on the surface it wouldn't. And there's also type 3 fusion proteins which are like the HA of flu and the type 1s. These are perpendicular to the membrane. They tend to be a mix of alpha helices and beta sheets. They also form trimers. And you find these in rabies and herpes viruses. These uh, type 2 fusion proteins that lie on the membrane. They also hide their fusion protein, just like the type 1 fusion proteins. Uh, so here are just two different kinds of type 2 uh, fusion proteins from an alpha virus and a flavivirus, virus, and they show two different mechanisms of, of this hiding. Uh, in the alpha virus, uh, the fusion peptides, which are shown as these loops here, these are, these are trimers or dimers, uh, the fusion peptides are hidden by a second protein. Okay, and then the second protein is cleaved and moved out of the way in order to get fusion. So very much like the HA has to be cleaved, these have to be cleaved, but it's not the actual fusion peptide in this case, it's a second peptide that, that masks it, if you will. And here for the flavivirus uh, fusion proteins, again, the peptides are hidden close to the membrane, and at low pH, these rise up and insert uh, into the cellular membrane. So very, very similar um, mechanisms for all of these fusion peptides. The most important thing, I think, is really to hide the fusion peptide so that it doesn't simply fuse with everything. So fusion is always regulated, okay? It can't occur in the wrong place. Evolution has selected for viruses that have mechanisms to regulate fusion because if you do it in the wrong cell, you don't succeed. You can't replicate and you never make it to the next step. You become extinct. Often proteolytic cleavage activates the fusion protein for cleavage. Remember, we saw that with the hemagglutin of influenza uh, for class one. For class two, a cleavage of a second protein can activate it. Uh, and then, of course, low pH in many cases also uh, triggers fusion. Now, back to the influenza virus uh, story. I want to tell you one more uh, thing about this entry step, which is quite interesting. Remember, the virus is taken into the endosome at low pH. The HA undergoes a conformation that puts the fusion peptide into the cell membrane. It hairpins and fusion occurs. Now as this is happening, uh, th remember there, there are protons being pumped into uh, the interior of the endosome. Remember the virus also has a channel in its membrane, the M2 ion channel, which we talked about last time. And the function of that occurs right at this step. These protons that are pumped in by the endosomal pumps then flow through uh, the M2 ion channel and enter the interior of the virion. That is not needed for fusion of the H mediated by the HA. Rather, those protons that are flowing into the virion, they have to get in there to dissociate the RNA of the virus so that it can get out. So these um, RNAs here would stick to the membrane even when the fusion event occurred if the interior of the of the particle hadn't been acidified by, by the flow of these protons. And this then allows them to enter uh, the cell. I think we have a movie of this. Yes, so here's influenza virus entry. And here there are uh, a few things wrong, or maybe one thing wrong, but here they're calling this a capsid, which uh, I, I wouldn't do. This is an M protein, sh which is a shell of sorts below the membrane, but it wouldn't be described as a capsid. But more on that in a moment. So here's the influenza virus with its HA and its uh, NA glycoproteins. And here it is bumping around on an epithelial surface in your respiratory tract. It's going to interact with a receptor that has sialic acid uh, on it. 
taken into the cell by the endocytic pathway. Part of that is a clathrin coated pit, which then pinches off and becomes a clathrin coated vesicle, moves into the cell. At some point, the clathrin will fall off, which is part of the endocytic pathway here. It's moving along a microtubule, which is correct. Doesn't move freely here, the clathrin is coming off. Presumably now the pH has been dropping as the vesicle moves so that now you get a fusion event which deposits the ribonuclear proteins here into the cytoplasm and then they get imported into the nucleus because that's where uh, they're going to replicate and they go through the nuclear pore. Now there is one thing that's not quite right about this. Now I know I'm a little fussy but after all this is, this is what I do for a living, right? So I have a right to be fussy. This is not a capsid and I think well, let's look on the next slide. I took a, f a capture of this. So here's what they're labeling a capsid. This is technically not a capsid. This is simply an M-protein shell. The M-protein is, be is below the membrane of many viruses. It gives the membrane stability, but it doesn't really form a capsid like that on its own. But what's even worse is they've got it making triangles. That's what icosahedra do, right? Icos icosahedra have the triangular faces. And influenza symmetry is not icosahedral by any means. But yet they've made the M protein into an icosahedron. So they've confused their um, morphologies a bit. So one day when some of you become illustrators, I hope you remember that when you make your, your virus entry movie. So this is not a capsid and these are not icosahedral uh, in symmetry. So the, again, the, the M protein of influenza is simply a supporting protein below the membrane. It doesn't really form a capsid on its own. If you took the membrane away, it wouldn't exist as a capsid. Here's entry of another uh, virus which has those type 2 glycoproteins, the ones that lie on the cell surface parallel. This is taken up uh, by endocytosis. The vesicle is moving down a microtubule and as the interior acidifies, the glycoproteins stand up, right? These are raising up, reaching towards the membrane. The fusion peptides are at the tips there. I like the acidification effect, all the sparkly stuff, right? So here are the fusion peptides inserting into the endosome membrane. They're going to hairpin right now and draw the membranes closer. You see this, this cell membrane being drawn very close. The walking is a little extra. It looks insectoid, but Okay, here you see the two membranes brought close together, now they can fuse. And then the contents of course will come out, the viral RNA can then come out and go into the cytoplasm. And here the, the viral RNA is a single molecule, so si simply comes out in the cytoplasm, it's plus stranded, so it can be engaged by ribosomes uh, right away. <laughs>